Welcome to Talent Hub Talk. I am Ben Duncan, and this is a place where prominent and inspirational figures from both the local ANZ and global Salesforce Ohana share their stories. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Michael Aird, an experienced Salesforce program leader. Mick talks us through his early career and how he first came to work with the Salesforce platform. We then discuss how he moved into consulting and how having a background on the business side of Salesforce projects has helped him. Mick explains his view on how close to the technology a project or program manager needs to be, talks us through how Salesforce projects have changed over the years, details what a program manager is really responsible for, and provides some insight into his ways of leading and his approach to managing people. I hope you enjoy the episode. Mick, welcome to the show. Okay, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for uh, getting me on. No, no, I'm excited. I'm excited to, uh, to unpick your journey and, uh, and yeah, delve into the world of, of project delivery. Um, now, I know you as um, someone that is the head of delivery program management, that kind of senior level leadership on, on Salesforce projects ultimately and uh, within Salesforce consulting practices. But that's not what you've always been, obviously. You've kind of led up to this point. So can you tell me a bit more about your, your background um, and, and the kind of steps that have moved you and taken you into the delivery leadership space? Yeah, no problems. Um, my pleasure. Look, I'm a chartered accountant. Well, I, I was. I don't pay my fees anymore, right? So please, uh, you know, no lawsuits for any advice I give. Um, but yeah, I started off as a chartered accountant in Adelaide, Deloitte. It was a great thing. Uh, you know, I then decided to go to London, which a lot of people did, you know, for 28 for the working holiday visa. Uh, I worked for a number of organisations there and it landed in IBM. Um, which was just sort of purely in Ireland. Uh, I'd moved there to get married, worked there, and started to get involved in sort of the sales sort of pricing, profit management type of thing. Came back to Australia uh, with IBM, started to work with the sales folks, and, you know, like we'll dig into that. Um, yeah, there was SAP CRM, right, but I was a bit of an output type of guy. You know, we were looking at the, the you know, the, in, you know, the inputs for pricing, the outputs for profit, you know, the inputs for sales targets, the output for sales performance. And um, that sort of got me the job at Australia Post. They were obviously changing from, I guess, you know, internal government post office to sales, right? They were selling. And I, I had no idea the Australia Post would be selling when I used to use the service. So you get there, that um, selling letters, um, they're selling parcels, they're selling identity, they're selling retail products. And so I headed up the sales performance there in a large group. Uh, and started to use Salesforce. Um, they were taking SAP CRM out. The, the, the team inside the operations group uh, who were managing the original, um, I guess, input of Salesforce, or the, you know, the first part of the transformation, and and ultimately getting the metrics right. How did opportunities look? You know, loading the targets, the data side, and the, you know, the dashboards reporting, all that sort of stuff. Sort of, I was hand in glove while we were putting it in. And that was a Salesforce piece, right? I didn't know much about Salesforce then. That was probably 2012, other than, yeah, it looked really cool. Everyone complained about SAP CRM. So we spent that time in the, the basically the second year was the full, um, I guess, uplift of it. First they put it in, then they uplifted it. Um, they bought the other half of Star Trek, so they paid for that. And then there was obviously a huge project of about 18 months to migrate the Star Trek business um, in, you know, off their legacy systems into Salesforce, right? So again, it's Salesforce. But it's in my, under my guise of sales performance. So, you know, I, I probably spent 60% of that year, 18 months working on, you know, on the project, making sure that my stakeholders are, you know, getting what they need, doing some work between the red side of Australia Post and let's say the blue side, which was Star Trek, trying to get some synergies between they, how they saw sales and marketing and the data they needed to sort of run and manage their business. So yeah, that was it. That was the sort of Salesforce piece. And from when I finished. Um, Australia Post, I've, I've been in, like, let's call it the ecosystem, you know, ever since Salesforce has been sort of, uh, other than one small uh, stint at exactly, uh, which is sales performance, um, I've been in the, the ecosystem, you know, either, you know, one side or the other um, for the last sort of 11, I feel old when you say this, sort of the last sort of 11 or 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, nice. So obviously, um, you a lot of that time has been on the consulting side, um, you know, you've been, uh, been in a range of different size partners and um but how did like if you go back to that kind of sales performance work the on the business side of a salesforce transformation a salesforce engagement um how has that experience helped you in consulting yeah that's a good question being an accountant you know it spend was always capex 
right? So I was in Australia Post. It was a significant amount of money put aside to invest. You turn up with your accountant's hat on. Yep, here's CapEx. You know, everyone's asking the right questions. You pay the money up front. Use consultancy. Um, but ultimately, it had the business case behind it. Um, so it wasn't fully just investment. Um, you know, there were efficiencies that needed to be made through the sales folks. And obviously, with my clients or customers being the sales and product uh, salespeople inside Australia Post, you know, my job was to work with them to ensure they you know, were able to relate what benefits they were expecting to get out of the system. So, you know, it might have been a smoother pipeline, might have been different sales stages, might have been different percentages, might have been different ways to input notes, Ben. You know, um, how do I, I've been out to a client, how do I put my notes in, you know, how do I put my next steps in? Um, and so there was the sort of efficiency process side of that. Um, and then there were some, I guess, cost out, right? So, or some revenue uplift in this case. So, um, theory would be Salesforce, um, would be able to make the selling, selling process more efficient. So therefore opportunities would close earlier. So sort of my role there was really just working with the sales GMs. There was two at that point, uh, and the sales managers and sellers as, as I guess the, I guess the customers, you know, what, what benefits are they putting into the business case? Uh, and then, you know, ensuring that as we were doing the build out, um, and doing the sort of, uh, you know, stage release, those stakeholders were getting their value, right? And, and ultimately then that translates to being able to report back up, um, inside Australia Post that yep, X dollars was invested. You know, these are the milestones that were hit. Um, you know, clearly, yes, the efficiencies are there, you know, and, and some of it's, future so you're going from a baseline of what we expect to future um but yeah just really representing the stakeholders um sitting in meetings where there was clearly you know the lights and blue wolf and all the consultants were there uh but sitting there representing the client side um so very much you know um the parcels and letters business and retail business sales and product um folks were, were my clients you know i felt like i represented them because you know my job was to manage sales performance with the team and and you know we were trying to give them the information they needed so um yeah the spend was there um but you know my job was sort of represent uh, represent them and you know communicate to them so then when you are on the consulting side do you have like a, a better appreciation now for your customer and the person sat in the chair that you were sat in yeah like a hundred percent right um Having spent, oh, this is where you declare how old you are, having spent sort of 20 plus years in business as a chartered accountant, pricing profit, you know, lots of sort of commercial roles and you spend the last sort of 10 or 11 in a Salesforce ecosystem between client and consulting, you then understand that, yep, the, it's the same process. There's a CapEx spend there. Um, clients are either working out do they have in-house technical capability to do it or is it fully consulting or is it a hybrid model? Um there's a business case behind it, right? Very rarely. I mean, we can read about CBA, you know, blowing their budget by 130 million. Um, you know, there's always a cost impact, but there's the, the time and the quality. Uh, so just, just fully trying to understand that when you're sitting there in a, as a consulting, you know, whether you're a partner or you're one of multiple partners there, the process happens the same on the client side. So there will be a business case. There will be benefits. Uh, it could be efficiency. It could be revenue. It could be cost out. It could be people out. So sort of ensuring that those steps uh, really clear up uh, up front and understanding as a consulting partner what the client's going to get, what they're giving up, or what they're expecting to achieve when they pay the bill, right? And I'll talk really simply today, right? Like uh, um, when the client pays the bill and the invoice, you know, they've got to be getting what they believe they were getting and what they were giving up, right? So ultimately you're giving up something here. You know, the, the, the dynamics have changed, I guess. Some organisations are happy to invest, but you're unlikely to see a lot of clients these days just turning up with significant capital because it's it's at scarce and you know they need it for multiple places to just put into a crm fully sunk cost without any expected benefit uplift etc so you know that's what i sort of try and do and you know generally most of the people you work with in the consulting um landscape uh, are aligned but you know the, the job feels like and you know, i wear two hats which I know is a, a bit of a coin phrase, but I wear that client hat trying to just put myself in the position of if we share that information with the client, how they're going to respond or how does that line, align to their expectation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, I think like there's this um, debate whether or not, um, like if you look at a project manager delivering a Salesforce project, there's a debate as to how much they need to know about Salesforce. Um, like do they need to understand the technology? Do they need to get it? Do they need to have come from a Salesforce background? Um, obviously, you you have um, you've you've been in the the you know the 
the, on the, the project of a, a Salesforce implementation um, prior to being a, a delivery focused person. Um, so obviously now you've gone up, you're not a project manager, you're, you're more senior than that. So the, the question, I guess, still um, is still relevant. Um, like, but do you feel a project manager does need to know the technology and a program manager doesn't? Or um, do you think they both should? Or do you think they both don't need the, the, the sales of technology experience? They just need to know how to deliver a project? I think it helps, right? So if I take myself back very briefly, if you can indulge me to when I went to a Perio and I was asked to go and manage a squad, right, to get back, let's call it on the tools, down into the detail, you know, to help me with my delivery sort of journey and uh, like education. And it helped, right, Back being back there. So I think as a project manager, and some have come through a development life cycle and worked out they're not there or a tester or, you know, a scrum master and all. So I think if you, you know, as a project manager, understanding the technology, I think is really, really important because what it does is helps you relate. Like your clients are your delivery team, your developers, your functionals, your consultants, right? So being able to be more in tune with them, I think is really key. So, you know, my advice to project managers out there, yep, there's, you know, Agile and there's Scrum and there's all, you know, Prince 2 is, you know, a couple of base Salesforce certifications I think helps, right? Because, because the people you're going to talk with every day, that's the way they talk, right? Mm-hmm. They're thinking tech. Then I think as you move to program, having a base understanding of it, it helps. I mean, you've got to understand all your clouds. I mean, you know, clearly you rename, you know, um, communities, et cetera. There's product uh, changes. But I think you're knowing it. I think you've got to know what it is going to do, right? Um, you don't have to specifically know the speeds and feeds and, the, you know, you don't have to understand the intricacies of a data model. But you've got to understand a data model is a core principle when you're looking to, you know, take data out of one system, perhaps put it into Salesforce, maybe it's one or two way integration. Um, you do need to understand what, what the sort of components and the aspects are there. Um, now that's not to say like I'm, you know, I'm one of a, of, of hundreds and hundreds of sort of program delivery folks out there. There'll be some, there will be some really good, cool folks out there that are, are really technical, right? And they may have come from, architecture through strategy, you know, now they sit there. And and I think, you know, the, the way it is, most programs, projects, it's a little bit complementary, right? What, what what staff do I have or what team do I put together to be able to get the best outcome? So if you had a project manager, I guess, who was non-technical, then you'd probably want someone in program or delivery that was technical. Or you have a number of um, architects who are perhaps on the on the project full time, who who are a little bit more advisory. Um, so I guess in a roundabout way, it's definitely going to help. Um, but then you know, if you flip it, do I need to be fully technical if I'm sitting in front of COO, Chief Customer Officer, yeah, maybe the CIO? Um, probably not. Like they're probably less interested in the specifics of what the product is technically delivering as they are, you know, what outcomes is it going to be for my business? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, in a round of, I think it helps. It certainly, you know, wouldn't dissuade anyone from it. But, um, yeah, it's all about comp- putting complementary, you know, resources together um, to deliver programs. And um, you, you obviously mentioned t- 2012-ish was when you were doing that work with Auspost. Um Since then and, and since you've kind of been further embedded into the ecosystem working with partners, what have you noticed about like the scale, the complexity, the 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 um, the challenges um, of a Salesforce project now compared to the back then when you first started delivering project? I think the scale uh, for an inter- large enterprise like Australia Post, there's multiple enterprises out there that's still doing the um, yeah, that level. I think what it is is probably it's. Um, more transformational now, more uplift. You know, I think the enterprises out there that, you know, are looking for Salesforce have Salesforce or they put it in for a specific piece and now they're adding um, or, or are they transforming. So I think the scale's there and, again, it, it's often very client-specific and, and how big is their business and what the value of the tool will be. Um, yeah, I think the way the projects have changed is certainly, is certainly different. Uh, COVID's clearly and being remote has had a force change there. Uh, but, you know, the governance is there, the steering committees are there. Uh, you know, it used to be 30, you know, Australia Post, I reckon once every two weeks it was 30 people sitting in a, in a boardroom on level 10, you know, lots of slides. That's still there. But it might be 8 o'clock in the morning and at half an hour, 20 people on a, a, on a Zoom or, or some level of media. Um, 
think what has changed, though, ultimately is the communications. So, you know, back then, we'll call it pre-COVID, right, for the interests of the podcast, um, comms sort of seemed to be in office hours uh, and there was a bit of a, we start the week with a lot of comms about what we do and we finish the week, which is, you know, some way, yep, yeah, we're going to close it down and let everyone go. Um, and plus a little bit of a, oh, God, I forgot to do that, so I better send that email, right, because my boss may be checking. Um, I think now definitely delivery is 6 a.m. in the morning till 12 o'clock at night because a lot of people are remote and hybrid working as well. So email seems to be the preferred channel to get a lot more information out. Um, and that sort of has its challenges um, because ultimately if you are that way inclined and there's that much technology around, um, you know, you can be sitting there at you know, 6.15 in the morning and just having a cup of coffee and, you know, working uh, yeah. or responding to email. So I think that, that side of delivery has definitely changed. And that, but that's, you know, that's Salesforce delivery. Work has changed. Our lives have changed post-COVID. But, um, yeah, like the... What used to be that great Friday afternoon sit down, you know, everyone in the office, we've had a great week, just knocked out a really big piece of work or we're prepped for next week, we've passed our testing, you know, let's have a cheese and biscuits and a beer or a glass of wine, you know, is not there, right? So I think that side has changed and actually, you know, that I think that side is, was truly undervalued um, because there's a whole heap of camaraderie that comes from both clients and partners, yeah, and I think, you know, I'll talk about post and when multi-partners in there, uh, Uni and Melbourne, multi-partners in there. So ability to sit there on Friday afternoon and, you know, uh, representing a period, having a, you know, a beer with someone from Deloitte and someone else from, a, you know, marketing cloud consultancy and about we're delivering this really cool project for Uni and Melbourne. Um, you just don't get when it's remote, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, virtual drinks, so I, I, yeah, I'm, I, I've participated, but I wouldn't say they, uh, <laughs> they're a hit. So that, that, that's certainly the top and tail of the week and how you'd set up, I think, has definitely changed. Yeah, it's interesting you, you say all those things because, um, like, I think for everyone, uh, like, you know, work life balance through COVID has been a challenge and, and kind of continues to be like Slack constantly pinging and, um, <clears throat> But if, if you consider yourself like on a project, if you're the program manager or program director, like what are you responsible for aside from delivery? Like is it you're delivering to a scope, right? That's a predefined scope, a budget, like the, the, there's certain things that you need to meet and stay within. But is it your responsibility also to uh, like enforce standards around how the project is delivered? In, in, like could a program manager say, right, we're not going to work past 6 p.m. Like these are the hours that people work between like, or is ultimately that kind of counterintuitive in, in terms of being able to deliver something? No, it's not counterintuitive. I'm probably, probably going to tap a little bit into a bit of my sort of leadership DNA here. Like I feel like as a like a delivery leader, you know, a, a leader in general, I've got a innate responsibility to ensure all people in the project, um, you know, have some work-life balance. Um and that is the staff that, you know, and the consultancy that I'm directly referring to, but the same as the client side is, you know, if you've got a schedule in place and you understand no one's doing schedules on 50-hour weeks, 60-hour weeks, so things go wrong. But I think if you top and tail each day, you top and tail each ceremony to make sure people are okay, you know, my job is generally trying to get the work done at the start of the week so you can, you know, get to the end of the week without the scramble. Right, and if you do that once, it's okay. If you if your people trust you, they'll do the work. You know, the client will trust you because you know you're doing over and above. But if that becomes a repeated thing, then you know, my view, I'd rather dig in a little bit more. Are we making the, the incorrect assumptions, or is there too much, you know, push, or there's there, you know, other forces that are coming to force that? Because you know, most of the whether it be devs and techs and um, tech BAs, BAs. Uh, they're the experts, right? Like to be clear, they do the certifications. They all they get their badges. You know, they work it through the Salesforce, you know, capability. So they know what they're doing. So if they're suddenly having to continually spend more time in there, just go back to the basics. Are the requirements wrong? Do we underestimate the stories? And so having spent time as a PM, you, you get to know that. Um, you know, a lot of execs perhaps don't um, care for that bit of inf- that information, but I think having that information and understanding how it impacts. The delivery, but yeah, like I'm pretty, I'm pretty keen. You don't have to have a family to have work life balance. Um, and I think the world has completely changed, right? And, and working from home doesn't mean your eight hour day is now 11 hours. 
Um, some people naturally will always want to do a little bit more and that's okay as long as they're doing it willingly uh, and not forced. But yeah, I, I do think, you know, some, cause you, you're going to have those weekends at work. So there will be those, those sprints as an example that are, um, you know, literally 14 days in a row, right? Because the plan means you need to be working Saturday, Sunday, but that's generally known up front. Right, uh, and yet you've always got break fix, you've always got emergencies, you've always got sev ones, sev twos. You know, if you're in managed services, so you're always going to do that work. But yeah, like it's almost like um, permanent overtime, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that's just me as a leader because you want the people to come back, right? I mean, the success of programs and delivery and consultancy firms and career pathing is really about people being engaged, right? Through through COVID, I think people had no choice; they stayed. Uh, and then, you know, post-COVID, you probably saw on your side, right, there was a lot of activity, a lot of people moving, right? They felt mm-hmm. like, oh, like I had to stay where I was. Now it might be coming back the other way and, you know, people are looking to, to get some change. But, um, yeah, I think you want people to be turning up. Like you don't want to send them home Friday, you know, at 7 o'clock such that the first thing they're fearing when they go home, lock off, chat to their partner, is I'm not looking forward to coming in Monday. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a horrible cycle. Um, so, you know, that, but that has us other challenges, right? We probably don't have time to talk about that today, but that has challenges about you've got to rotate people through, you've got to give them opportunity, right? Um, you've got to give them variety. And ultimately, sometimes in a big consulting firm, that's that, that, they don't want to swear words, right? We can't cycle people up. Client loves Ben. We've always had Ben. Yeah, but Ben's been on the client for nine months and he really doesn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit like, how do I get to Ben after three months or where's the natural position where, I can have a chat to Ben about, hey, mate, what do you want to do next? And then start to have that conversation. Ben would like to move to marketing cloud or Ben would like to go to you know, FSC. He's been in comm for ages, you know. So that's the dynamics, right? That's the, but that might, that may be how my brain's wired, right? Like, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a role now, as you know, right? And that's how we've sort of um, been back in contact pretty regularly is that's how my brain thinks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so it's hard to move away from that. Uh, they call me a little bit old school, but yeah, I think the people are the assets, right? Um, you know, and, and I don't say that disrespectfully, um, but they are the, the magic. They are the people that get it done. You know, yeah. um, delivery leadership in a way is probably about hundred, you know, hundred percent, hundred percent supporting the team. And then the other 20%, you know, over and above is sort of keeping the comms in tune. So everyone understands that team are turning up to do the right job and they're the experts. So let's, let's give them time. Let's give them the space. Let's give them the support to do that work, right? Because it's not always going to work, right? It does, you know, there's no project out there that goes from start to finish that doesn't have hiccups, right? So set up for success and, you know, support the team and then you'll get the extra, right? That's my view. You know, um, people have got to disagree, which is absolutely cool, but that's my view. Set them up for success and they'll do the extra mile for you as and when you need to. But, you know, these days you've got to be able to reward them for that too. It's not that you can't keep going to the well or people will go, stuff that, I'll call Ben, you know, and I'm out, right? And the cost of replacing people is huge, right? Like you'd have those conversations with your own clients every day yeah. about the cost of replacing people. Yeah, 100%. You, you said something in a previous conversation had that stood with me or stuck, uh, stuck with me. Um, you said no one ever turns up to work to do a bad job. Yeah, I believe that. But have you always had that view? Is that something? Because I think like, that's not you, – you have to have – like I'm sure you've had experiences in the past where, you know, you have felt let down by someone in the team. So, like, how have you been able to kind of see through that and see the, like, you know, that there must be more to it than, than them just turning up and not wanting to function in the way that they should? Yeah. Look, probably before I was a people leader, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't have that view. You know, because you're working in a team and, you know, maybe seven or eight of you, you know, as chartered accountants, we're all trying to put, push work together and you think, oh, old mate over there or, you know, that's just taking the p one five double S, right? Like it's just um, then you become a people leader and I think you, you, you have an obligation to understand there's a little bit more going on. And, and this is a non-COVID conversation, right? So COVID has probably changed it for a lot of people, but I think it's changed it for a positive for a lot of people because, you know, maybe going into work every day in the office was putting so much stresses on them with their their own thing. So I think there's people that are probably more efficient. But, you know, I have this view and people can say it's folly, but I, I actually believe it's true is, you know, if you're spending your time doing your certifications and whatever, you're turning up to do a good job. Now, whether you fully execute that day because there's other things going on, right, or you just don't feel great or you got a cold or you got a headache or you didn't sleep well, um, but I think it's easy to performance manage someone now because most people turn up to do the right thing and then 
you can see through the engagement, you see through the buy-in, right? Um, and you see with how people are working. And, and in a way, you've got metrics around story points and architecture sign-offs. And, you know, everyone in a role in a Salesforce project has a professional, you know, um, I guess, role to play. You know, your scrum master's doing story, po- story points, working through the board. Architects got to get documents signed off, you know, et cetera, from the client. Uh, devs are devving stories that are getting tested. So, you know, I do believe there's so many processes in Salesforce delivery that you can sort of, I would say, catch bad work. You know, like that, that probably sounds a horrible thing to say, but, it, you know, Friday um, is you catch the work, right? That the actual delivery process catches the work, which allows you to go back and go, oh, okay, so we're putting three, you know, this will be me as technical as I get, right? We're putting three branches in. You know, this afternoon to the QA environment and oh, Ben's branch, gee whiz, you know, a lot of quality issues. You know, you shouldn't know that after a three week sprint yeah. where you've been dev in 30 stories, right? Um, yeah, so I do think, I do think people turn up to do the right job, right? Um, and, you know, but maybe that's me as a leader. Uh, maybe that's me, you know, and maybe people say, which is, which is fine for me, um, is, that's a gap in my technical knowledge, so I'm putting full trust into the technical folks. So in a way, it's sink or swim, right? If I go in with that mindset, I'm setting myself up. But that's a risk I'm prepared to take, right? We've all got to be vulnerable. So I'd mm-hmm. rather be vulnerable, I guess, you know, in a way with um, taking the position that everyone turns up to do a, a good job and then getting advice. Otherwise, all your know, outcomes show otherwise. But then that's it. You just flip to your other side of your leadership dimension, which is, you know, you're having regular one-on-ones and if you're not aware of something going on, um, then you pick it, you know, you pick up your socks and you deal with it. So, you know, I, I guess I, I form that view, Ben, because I'm probably delivery leader and leadership management and, you know, technical practice leader. So I get to work with, the, you know, I've been lucky enough in the last couple of jobs to get to work with the folks that are delivering and get to work with the folks from a practice point of view. So you're spending time, even if you're not on their projects, with them, with their one-on-ones. So, you know, that's um yeah, I'm gonna hold that view. I've got plenty of years left to to work. I'll hold that view and I'm happy to be challenged otherwise that um, you know, people aren't. Because I think if they aren't these days, they don't enjoy it, right? If you get a lot of people, good people in a squad, that the people that don't want to do the job probably opt out anyway or tap out. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh God, Ben's annoying me. God, every day he wants to dance and he's so upbeat and you know, like, I don't really <laughs> like the job, right? That enthusiasm, I can't deal with it. <laughs> uh, it's it's true. Like it is true. Your bigger practices you get, right? The, the 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 numbers and the number of staff and the 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 variations between sort of what folks you get in there. It, it is true. You know, some it, it, you know people get left behind and they sort of opt out. So is, is your job really on a project, a big project, to know every day where everything is at? Like you should know, kind of not to the minute, but like you you need to be across everything basically. So if if something is going to go wrong, you can kind of see that early enough. Yeah, I'd say that's true. Right now, um, that's a choice I make. You know, um, some some roles is clear, um, but that's a choice I make. Um, by through working with the team, working with the squad to understand what we're looking to get, because ultimately that allows us to plan out the week. You get an illness, you get an unexpected event, you've got to be able to plan for that. And it's all about options. You know, client might change something, client, client might come to you later in the week. Um, something might go wrong. So I think, you know, I think in a, a, you know, as a, as a senior delivery, um, you know, individual, my, I've got to be thinking about all options and under, you know, understanding all the data points and all the, and all the sort of, I guess, working elements inside the project allow me to think about that. And then some weeks you just go through and you don't ever have to think about the options because it works as you expect, right? Which is tick. That's great. Let's move on. And generally it, it does work. Um, more often than not, right? And depending on the sort of folks you've got and what their um, bent is to sort of jump in and, and, and fix things early, you often get some really good leaders inside there and they may not even think they're leaders yet, but someone who works out that there was an architectural decision made that's now going to impact, you know, a future, you know, I guess development cycle and then understanding the requirements are out that comes to you with, hey, we found this on Tuesday, it's Thursday, this is what we've done to fix it. Now they don't. They're not probably thinking they're leading, but they're leading, right? Um, other people might let that all the way go through to me, and it'll be like, right, okay, this is this isn't the first time this has happened. What did I do last time? Mm-hmm. You know, and then you, I think you grab the team, right? That's that's perhaps a little bit circular to why I think everyone turns up to do a job. Good job. First thing you can do is grab the team. Okay, it's not 
why did we get here? It's how are we going to go forward? Mm -hmm. So with that, though, like obviously, yeah, someone's coming to you on the Thursday and saying, look, this happened on Tuesday. Like what what about the people that, um, you know, bury that? Not not because they're they're wanting some, but they're worried about giving you bad news. Like, and I guess the sooner you hear the bad news, the better, right, as a, as a delivery leader. Yeah, no, I mean, you get that, though. That's it. And I don't think, you know, I just don't think that's people not wanting to do a good job, right? That's people's fear of, my God, I, I, you know, something's gone wrong, right? Um, I would hate to think people f- have worked with me in the last sort of eight to 12 years and thought that they can't come to me with bad news. Now, that's not to say people haven't, right? They, they clearly have in the past. Um, but I think then it's just about how you react. If, if someone waits the two days, it's how you react. I'm all about solutions, right? I'm all about what happens next and how do we go forward. Um, and ultimately, sometimes you don't have a solution then and there. So, you, you know, my job, you've got to ante up to the client and say, this we've come across this and right now I don't have an answer. Um, never be bl- – you know, you're never, you're never blaming the team really. I think that's a cop-out, right? Mm-hmm. I front into it. I'm accountable for it. Um, you take it on the chin. Um, and you make a commitment to get it resolved, right? If you don't know, then you don't say it'll be done Friday. <laughs> yeah. I, you'd say, I need an hour. I need two hours. I'm not sure. Right? Sure. And it is one, like, you know, if it's about a major go live and whatever, clearly everyone understands that the workday stretches because the deadline can't change. But if you're mid sprint, you know, mid stage, even if you're in waterfall, right, there's time, there's time to course correct. Mm-hmm. You know, very rarely um, do you get to that situation. Um, but you know, sometimes the deadlines don't change, and that's when you scale up the work, right? And if you've got the if you've got the relationship with the team, um, you know, most people are happy to scale up or do the extra to get it back on track. Do you, it, like I think that's really refreshing um, your approach to that, and and I think that's what everyone that is reporting to someone would want to hear, right? Like I I can go to them with problems; it can't all be. Um, you know, rainbows and, and whatnot. It, it, sometimes we're on projects, things go wrong. I need someone that I can go to for that support and um, not get told off ultimately. But do you think the stereotypical leader on IT projects has changed? Like if you look over the last kind of, you know, 10, 10 15 years, do you think like that that approachable um, leader is something that's that's more kind of modern than, than historic? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I generally do. I think, yeah, here... I think you have choice, right? Uh, you know, move, we talked uh, 20 minutes ago about how I ended up in Salesforce, right? Um, it's, this is no stereotypical path to delivery leadership. And in fact, probably 10 years ago, I'm happy to be corrected. There were probably no delivery leader roles in Salesforce, right? <laughs> you know, what's it been 20 plus years? So there was no, so you've become a leader and you've either come through the technology arm or you've come through the business arm, but you're a, you're a leader. So, um, I think it has changed. I, I think there's still, there's still a time and place for, technical project managers, you know, that just purely transactional, but as I said, you can compensate them with someone who has the ability to sort of, um, you know, paint the message. I think, you know, one of my old bosses, um, you know, and I'll, I'll say here, Joe Acuri, and it was actually interestingly mirrored by Paulette Hogan at a time is you've got to be thinking what's my boss's boss going to want to hear. So that's the way I that's the way I phrase that is like right if I you know it's not necessarily my boss what's my boss's boss we're going to hear, want to hear here and then you think God you know what's Gura well then you know Australia Post you think it's Ahmed for who oh, my God you know like, <laughs> panic panic but you're thinking well he he or she that just people they're running a business so what be the information do you got to give them so yeah I, you know um, there'll be people that watch this and think there's a little bit of perhaps master me in and the way he goes about it, but it is just me. Um, so I'll stand firm to that. That's the way I, that's the way I roll and that's why I'll continue to roll. You know, um, I'm not selling anyone down the river. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll, you, you got to take the, you got to take one every now and again, but I think it's the way you communicate to like, you know, if I, if I go to you, if your boss hears, that you've done a bad thing where you're your own boss, but let's roll with it, right? If your boss hears you've done a bad thing without hearing it first or hears it from someone else, right, you're in an awkward position, right? But if you've got a good enough relationship that, you know, you go to them, I've stuffed, you know, sometimes you've stuffed it, right? Let's be clear. (laughs) So if you go to them and say you've stuffed it, but this is what I'm going to do to fix it, um, yeah, but I think think there's still – you know, like depending on where I am in the uh, ecosystem, there still are people that are fully transactional, right? And but I think it takes all parties to go around. 
Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, you, you, you like we've mentioned, you've worked in different consulting firms, big, Aperio, massive, you know, global um, teams everywhere, huge teams. And then you've recently been engaged for a smaller partner. Do they ultimately, are they doing the same thing? Like, is it the same working in those different environments or are there major differences you, you noted? Yeah, no, I think they are, right? I think what I found um, in the smaller partner at Argo is uh, the age, right? You know, like a smaller partner, um, been going for four or five years, um, average age, you know, like I put, I put the average up a lot, right, when I join. Um, but the average age is a lot younger because um, that's perhaps on the, the growth, you know, uh, trajectory, right? Um, so they're doing the same thing, right? They're just doing it at a different scale. But that allows them to be able to be a little bit more nimble, to be a little bit changed, um, you know, le- perhaps less reliant on back-end systems. This is a big Wipro, which is global and thousands and thousands of people entering time. Uh, you know, entries and thousands of invoices and a lot of, you know, that process, if, it, if it's if it's out by 5%, the magnitude of the impact at the other end is huge. But, you know, with 20 people consulting firm, you know, if one or two people don't get their time in, you've got time on Monday morning, right, before you can just do the follow-up and say, hey, Mick, you'll put your timesheet in. We've got to close the books, you know, at the 11 o'clock and change to 11.30 because, you know, you're invoicing maybe 10 customers, right, as opposed to, you know, a, a, 500, 5,000 customers. So, yeah, I think that what, what everyone's trying to do is pretty much the same. I, I think just the age demographics there, uh, which is sort of slightly different, um, and being smaller, everyone's in, you know, I was the one person in Melbourne, one lady in Bali, everyone else in Sydney. So, you know, being smaller allows you to sort of, I guess, co-locate a lot more. Um, but, yeah, everyone's turning up to do, the, you know, I'll still say everyone um, that I work with at Argo versus a period, everyone's turning up to do the do the right job and do a good job. What about like delivery then? Does that change into you, you, uh, the different scales? Like, do you approach your delivery management role in the same way if you're delivering for a small business and let's say 50 users compared to delivering for Uni of Melbourne, hundreds of users? That's a great question. I can't remember whether we agreed on that one. Um, I don't, no, I don't think so, right? I think, I think I have a luxury in a smaller organization of becoming a little bit more familiar with the team, um, you know, because there's, there's less scale. So, you know, I, I get an opportunity to be across the, you know, 12 or 14 folks who are in the technical firm, whereas Wipro is much bigger. And when I was, uh, you know, delivery lead for Victoria, it was literally 60 people based in Victoria, right? I couldn't spend that time with them all. Um, but I knew the Union Melbourne folks because I'd been intrinsically on that account for a year. Uh, learned, learned the folks from mobile lending, you know, spent a bit of time with the guy who's a power corp. But that was probably, you know, I then compensated by when we had our quarterly catch ups spending more time with the folks who I didn't get an opportunity to see day to day because I wasn't on their account. I, I guess it's more, you know, a higher level. So, it, look, it has, I think there's, it's how you sort of approach it, Ben, I guess is the easiest answer there is, you know, the scale means you're not going to get across everyone because there's layers of management whose job is effectively to have um, have that relationship. Um, whereas, you know, I, you know, I was, you know, chat to the the head of solutions at uh, Argo pretty regularly and I'm still pinging one of the devs and one of the product managers, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, because you, you smaller you get a, a chance to work um, with them a little bit more closely every day. Mm-hmm. And uh, my, my final question, um, do you think like someone can set out on a path of learning to be a leader or someone can teach, like can you teach someone to be a good leader or is it just something that some people will become and learn, like they'll because of the environments they're in, because of their their um, approach, like natural skill set um, and beliefs, and do, like, what's your view on that? Like, can can you take someone from here A to B as a leader, or is that something they'll they'll find on their own path? Well, no, I think you can, right? I think you can, but I think it's more around. You, you, you can coach. Like so we use the words coach, right? A mentor, right? Because there's no, there's no, te- there's, there's a lot of textbooks and there's a lot of courses, but it's not like studying accountancy where I had to understand the theory and then I got tested on it, right? Um, there'll be hundreds of leadership books and leadership approaches, but everyone's going to take that differently. So I think it's, you know, if you, if you are fortunate to have good coaches and mentors and that's what you would like to do. Right. Yeah. I think you need to be a people person. I think it's pretty clear when people are on leadership courses who are for, you know, first time managers or they've had the promotion and they just, they don't feel like they want to be there because they're individual contributors, which is really cool. That's fine. Like it takes everyone. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's how you approach it, right? If you have good people, 
easiest way to become a good leader is if you've been working under good leaders, right? And you don't have to be directly under them too. Um, you know, I'll put a little plug in for a bloke called Mark LeBusk, right? He, his career at Australia Post versus what he does now are chalk and cheese, right? Mark was a leader, right? He was, but he was an agitator to me, right? This is the whole idea. He, he's a positive agitator because he was a sales manager and he wanted so much out of the system and, you know, his solutions team, you know, um, but he was leading by example, right? He was leading his team um, and he was showing me that, you know, you can positively challenge, right, uh, and walk away with some respect and you can do your job, right? You don't have to be yelling and screaming, you know. So you get those leaders who you don't directly work for, um, you see them operate and you think, God, they did something that, you know, that that worked, right? Um, but I think you've got to want to do it, right? And I think for, certainly for delivery leadership, right, when, you know, you and I have talked a lot, you're sitting on the waterline. You're spending half your day looking up into the boat where the client is, all the stakeholders up there. You're spending the other half, you know, let's call it under the water, working with the delivery team and you can rotate, you know, multiple times a day through there. So, you, you know, that's the challenge, right? You, you've got to work out which leadership had to bring, Um and you know, you, you, you no, you know, no, no hour can be the same. No two days can be the same. Um, but you got to roll with it, right? Like I think this is the thing: is um, I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think leaders that the, they enjoy it, right? I think you know the reluctant. We all know the reluctant leader. Um, I think there's less of those these days. Um, but it, like everyone leads. Like it, you know, I know that's uh, a little stereotypical, but how you carry yourself. Is leadership, right? You don't have to manage people directly or in, you know, and uh, there's matrix organizations. You get a chance to lead, even though you're directly, you know, not directly accountable for folks. So, you know, certainly in Salesforce, you know, that role is very, you know, every day you're either talking to people internally in the consulting or you're talking to people, clients, or there's may- maybe a project team in between and there's multi vendor. So, you know, you get an op- I enjoy the opportunity to lead. Um, you know, um, always. Um, and having sat on both sides of the fence, um, uh, I think that makes it a little bit easier for me. Certainly comfortable. Yeah, nice. Well, look, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed hearing your approach, style, beliefs, and, and also background. Um, if anyone wants to pick your brains, um, you know, reach out, ask you some yeah. questions, where's the best place to find you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in LinkedIn. Absolutely. Yeah, all my details are up to date. Send me a message. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to get, you know, happy to, for anyone to go to you, Ben, you know. Um, I'm, you know, I won't get my mobile out here, but yeah. Oh, look, I enjoy it, right? I mean, clearly through this podcast, um, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, we sort of started to think about it and um, become really easily, right? So it's something I enjoy talking about, right? And, and I can thank you for you, right? Like, I mean, this is, this is um, you know, this is an unpa- unpaid plug, right? Like I am, I'm looking for a role, you're a recruiter, right? We've had a relationship for multiple years, Um but you take the time, you know, you respond, you're investing in your own business, which means you're investing in folks like me um, and you're prepared to spend the time and, you know, prepared to put me on the podcast, um, and which I'm, I'm super appreciative of, mate. Like, um, and to me, it's no guarantee that I'm getting a job. It's just uh, part of being a leader, right, in a relationship, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I enjoy talking to you, so why wouldn't I you know, be happy to talk about that? And, you know, you clearly believe I've got something to – that worth sharing, um, you know, through your sort of story and, and what you do. So, mate, uh, massive thanks for me. Uh, I really appreciate it. No, the pleasure's all mine. And, uh, yeah, all the best. I, uh, I think people listening to this will see the value you can add. So, uh, yeah, hopefully it will uh, lead to something. But um, I'm sure people will be appreciative of your story nonetheless. Yeah, no, absolutely. I might be, I'm, not, I'm not out there on my own, right? There'll be plenty of people that end up on the same in the same position as me. But you know, in a market like we've got at the moment, you're just looking for that you know, a couple of percent differentiator, right? So, to me, maybe, maybe that's uh, that's something I get out of that. But certainly not what I went into it for. It was just the opportunity to chat about it, and it's a little cathartic and you know somewhat fulfilling at the same time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right, mate. Happy Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the chat. And if you did, please make sure you have subscribed for future episodes that are coming through. I would also be very grateful if you would consider leaving a review on your chosen podcast platform as five-star reviews will help us to reach more trailblazers from across the world. I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon. And thanks again.